this morning. Let's stand. We're going to pray and welcome the Lord's presence. A scripture came to my heart this morning. I have it in the lineup there. If you could put it on the screen for us, Tanya. Isaiah 66, verse 2. I want us to think about this verse, especially the last part of the verse, as we open our time together today. Uh, we've got a lot of tyranny. We've got a lot of uh, hysteria, fear, mongering, things going on in our society. And I think the best thing for us to do in that time is get into God's Word. What does God say? Amen? What does He have to say? It's not so important what society has to say. And we know the enemy has an agenda. And uh, we need to have peace and faith that comes from God's Word. Isaiah 66, 2 says at the end of the verse, To this man will I look, to him, even to him that is poor, and of a contrite spirit, and trembles at my word. We want God to take notice of us. Amen. Really, this is talking about Jesus and what He would do in fulfilling God's redemption plan. But when we place our faith in Jesus, how many believe God looks to us? Amen. He wants to help us today. And so let's pray today that God will refresh us and help us as we're in His presence. And let all the fear be pushed aside. Let faith come. Amen. Let peace come. I believe God wants to do that this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We give you our hearts this morning. Lord, we're a desperate people. We need you, Jesus, today. We pray that you would walk among us. Lord, that your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, would dispel the lies this morning. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, help us to receive from your word something that will change us for eternity. God, we just give you glory. We give you praise. We thank you for what you're going to do in this service this morning. In Jesus' name.
morning. He's deserving of our highest praise. Amen. He's Jesus. Lord, we worship you today. God, we give you glory, Lord. Lord, you're the only one worthy of the glory, God. Hallelujah. You saved us. You've delivered us. You've set us free. You've given us life and life more abundantly. You're worthy of it all, Lord God. Lord, we want to catch a glimpse of how holy, how awesome, how mighty you are today. Lord, we just want to see you face to face in the beauty of your holiness, the splendor of your majesty, God. Lord, we just pray that you'll accept our worship. Lord, accept our praise as a sweet sound in your ear. We pray it's blessed you. Have your way in the remainder of this service, we pray in Jesus' name. share a message this morning entitled Faith Refined in the Fire. Faith Refined in the Fire. And I've shared this message before, but I felt like it's something that God is wanting to say again this morning. And uh, watch this quick video before we get into the Word this morning. Becoming a Christian has always meant following Jesus Christ. I have to say that because all sorts of people today want to make up their own path and call it Christianity. But if you take following Christ out of Christianity, you should really call it something else. Jesus spoke a lot about following Him and a good deal could be said about what it means. It does mean accepting Him as your Lord and Master. You can't really say you're following Jesus if you refuse to do what He commands. It does mean he's your teacher. It would be strange if you said you were following him but denied some of his teaching. And it must mean repenting of your sin and believing the good news because that's what he taught. So if you think about it, although the good news is about free salvation, it's something you can't pay for in any way. If you want to follow Jesus, it could cost you everything. Jesus put it like this. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Let's just think about that. You have to deny yourself. You probably already know that it's you that will get in the way of you following Jesus more than anything else. You, your sinful flesh, will have desires and ambitions and fears that will almost shout out at you, don't do it, don't follow Jesus. But if you're going to follow him, it means saying no to yourself. More than that, you have to take up your cross. People in Jesus' day had no difficulty understanding what that meant. It meant being ready to suffer, even the worst kind of persecution, even the ultimate cost. And there's no way you can follow Jesus if you're not prepared to suffer, if you're not prepared to acknowledge him, if you won't even own up to being his own follower. He himself said, anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. There's some smooth talking Paul's teachers who will invite you to follow Jesus and promise you health, wealth and prosperity. But Jesus didn't promise those things to his followers in this life. True Christianity brings you unspeakable joy but it's not a joyride. There's peace that passes all understanding. But Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Before you follow Christ, you ought to stop and count the cost. Following Jesus could cost you everything. So if that's the case, why would anyone follow Jesus? Well, thankfully, following him is not just about suffering. Jesus promised his followers spiritual life and the comfort of fellowship with the Holy Spirit called his followers, his friends, he gives us peace with God and a guarantee that whoever comes to him, he'll never cast out. For those who are in Christ, there's a promise that all things will ultimately work together for your good and a future inheritance waiting for you that makes any suffering in this life more than worthwhile. Count the cost. Good words to consider as we talk about this morning, faith refined in the fire. If you have your Bibles, grab them and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 
We're going to look at verses 11 through 15 in just a moment. And we want to look at some things that God is telling us about our faith, the faith that He accepts being refined in the fire and what that means to us. Listen to this story before we get into the Scripture. Some time ago, a few ladies met in a certain city to read the Scriptures and make them the subject of conversation. While reading the third chapter of Malachi, they came upon a remarkable expression in the third verse, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. One lady's opinion was that, was that it was intended to convey the view of sanctifying influence of the grace of Christ. Then she proposed to visit a silversmith and report to them what he said on the subject. She went accordingly and without telling the object of her errand, begged to know the process of refining silver, which he fully described to her. But sir, she said, do you sit while the work of refining is going on? Oh yes, madam, replied the silversmith. I must sit with my eyes steadily fixed on the furnace, for if the time necessary for refining be exceeded in the slightest degree, the silver will be injured. The lady at once saw the beauty and comfort, too, of the expression, he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Christ sees it needful to put his children into a furnace. His eye is steadily intent on the work of purifying, and his wisdom and love are both engaged in the best manner for them. Their trials do not come at random. God says the very hairs of your head are all numbered. As the lady was leaving the shop, the silversmith called her back and said he had still further to mention that he only knows when the process of purifying was complete by seeing his own image reflected in the silver. What a beautiful example. When Christ shall see his own image in his people, his work of purifying will be accomplished. What a story, amen? That's what God is wanting to do in us, refine us, purify us, Make us more like Him. Our faith this morning, it originated with Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? It all started with Him. He chose us. He began the good work in us. And so He wants us to allow Him to refine, to purify, to perfect that which He started in us. And that's what He wants to challenge us with this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's look at verses 11 through 15. I think we have those on the screen. Dad, could you help me in reading those verses this morning? For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. A reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. All right, and then turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 1. In verse 7, it says this, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Can you see in those verses, God's plan is that our faith be refined, it be purified in, uh, in the fire. Certainly we're facing some difficult times, but we don't have to lose heart. Amen? Amen? The refiner is in control. Jesus is in control. And He's going to shape us if we'll stay yielded to Him. So I want us to look at four keys to having our faith refined in the fire. Four keys to having our faith refined in the fire. Number one, no other foundation for our faith. Jesus Christ and the cross. We can see that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, there's no other foundation than Jesus. 
The foundation, the groundwork for our new life in Jesus begins at salvation when we simply confess Jesus as Lord. When we believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead, right? Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. Jesus told Nicodemus, it's like being born again. Everything that we need for life and godliness is provided for us by the sacrificial, atoning death of Jesus at Calvary. That's where it all begins. It should for the believer. The foundation of our faith is not the work of our own hands, our own pitiful efforts, even religious rituals, routines, and ceremonies. All of those eventually crumble, don't they? And they don't accomplish much as far as giving us real life. God wants, to, wants us to see that our foundation for our faith is Jesus Christ and the cross. The foundation of our faith is not Jesus plus, right? There's a lot of people who believe that and practice that today. It's Jesus alone. Jesus only is the foundation of our faith. Every other object of faith is simply a distraction. Sure, Satan would love to fill our minds with other objects of faith. A preacher, a religious organization, some other philosophy of life that's not in the scriptures. Because those are all a distraction. Every other so-called foundation of our faith is weak. It's frail and it's feeble. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Paul said this, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's what we need to have as our exclusive object of faith. Jesus and Him crucified. It worked for the Apostle Paul. Amen? If it worked for him, he authored at least 13 books of the New Testament, then it ought to work for us today in our faith. Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 warns us against false teachers and false preachers. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be what? Accursed. It really, that word in the original language, it comes out more strong as the word damned. Let him be damned if he preach another message other than Jesus and the cross. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. So the strongest word that Paul could use to tell people, stay away from Wrong objects of faith. People who are preaching something other than God's redemption plan. The precious blood of Jesus. Acts 4.12 Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. What name is that? Jesus. Jesus is the name by which we are saved. And so... If we're going to have our faith refined in the fire, we've got to make sure, first of all, that our foundation is Jesus and the cross. Number two, God's Word says our faith must be built up in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The foundation for our new life in Christ, it's laid at salvation, but we must build upon that first step. We must be in the process of sanctification. It's a theological term. You probably never use that in conversation with normal, everyday folks in the marketplace. But sanctification simply means that we're set apart. And when we first get saved, Jesus says, this one is mine. And we're sanctified. And if we were to die, we would go to heaven at that point. We're set apart as God's own. He writes His name across our heart. But it's also a process at that point. When God sets us apart as His own, He wants to refine us. He wants us to become more like Jesus. And that's sanctification. Simply becoming a little bit more like Jesus every day. Is that your heart's desire? God, I want to become more like Jesus. We've got to take that next step. Let our faith be built up. Let us not just have a foundation and no home, no walls, no structure built on it in our Christian walk. But let there be maturity. Let there be growth evident. Salvation began at the foot of the cross. And our sanctification, our building of our faith ought to take place as well at the foot of the cross. Where you got saved is where you stay saved. 
Where it all began is where it continues to grow. At the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. We need to keep Jesus as the object of our faith. No matter what Satan throws at us. Amen. No matter what difficulties we see in this world. Jesus is sovereign. Amen. He's in control. And that's what needs to take place in that sanctification process. Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7. They say this, Are you, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. That's our daily walk, right? So walk in Him. I don't know about you, but I was a little kid, five years old, weeping, and I didn't really know why, in the altar, Calvary Temple, Assembly of God, Riverside, California, when I first got saved because I had a sense that I needed God. I needed to get saved. He's saying in this verse, your sanctification process should still have that same humility, right? That same brokenness, that same desperate, God, I've got to have you, as you did when you first got saved. If you've lost that, where do you need to go? Back to where it all began. Amen? And I'm not talking about Riverside, California. I'm talking about the foot of the cross. Amen? Wherever that was for you. And we need to grow in our walk with the Lord. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. It's easy when we see all the craziness in the world to lose a heart of thanksgiving, isn't it? We ought to be thankful for what we do have. It's easy to focus on all the things we don't have. All the freedoms that we might be losing if we're not careful. But we need to have thanksgiving even in the midst of those difficult times for all that God has already done for us. If God never did anything else for us, He's still been good. Amen? He's still blessed us. What material will you use in building up your faith? In becoming a little bit more like Jesus every day? Will it be the gold and the silver and the precious stones that verse 12 talks about? Things that will endure when they're put to the fire test? Or will your things that you're building up your faith with be wood, hay, and straw? What happens to wood, hay, and straw when you put fire to them? They're gone. They're consumed, right? There, there's nothing to show for that. Too many are living their lives, think they're living their lives for God even, and it's really just wood, hay, and straw, things that are a waste of time that will have no bearing on eternity. God wants us to consider what we're building up our faith with. Listen to this quote. Fire, again symbolic of the Word of God, will be the standard. The idea seems to be concerning these durable materials of proper doctrine, the right motivation, and faithfulness. The phrase wood, hay, stubble, once again is used symbolically of that which will not stand the test of fire. We need to be people of sound doctrine. Amen? How can we make sure that we're people of sound doctrine? Open up your Bible. And don't just receive it second hand like you are right now. Open up your Bible. Make sure what the preacher is saying is what the Bible really says. Spend some time in the Word individually, firsthand, saying, God, speak to me today. Even if it's just a couple of verses before you go to school or work, God, I need to hear from you today. We've got to have that if we're going to have sound doctrine. And becoming a little bit more like Jesus, is your doctrine right? Are, you, are your motivations right? Are you being faithful to God's Word and the leading of His Holy Spirit? That's what God is wanting us to get a hold of. We've got to have the right foundation. If, if it's going to stand the test, faith refined in the fire, we've got to build up our faith every day. I trust that's why you're here today. God, I want to grow in my walk with you. And I'm hoping you've given Pastor Eric something that's going to help me in my walk. I'm hoping that in worship I can sense your spirit and get something that's going to help me not stay in the same place or go backwards or become stagnant, but God to progress and move forward. Someone commented on one of our anniversary videos. We had a video to stream that we were able to go to in Arizona. And it's one of Candy's friends uh, who's been here before. She commented how beautiful, and I had never heard this before, how beautiful a river, a stream is. Because it's typical of God's plan for our lives. It always goes forward and it never goes backward. Have you ever thought about that? That's amazing. God's will for your life is that you go forward and that you never go backwards. And think about that the next time you're looking at a beautiful stream that God created. That's God's plan for us. And we've got to stay 
in that place. Number three, our faith will have works and will be tested or will be proven. Our faith ought to have evidence, works, proof, whatever you want to call it. And those works, those, that evidence will be tested, they'll be proven. It's easy to say you know karate, right? I did have these things when I was growing up in high school, you know, you, Karate Kid was all popular, all those movies were coming out. And so this bully would be picking fights with people and wanted to fight somebody outside the playground, off school grounds, you know, because you didn't want to fight on school grounds or you'd get suspended. So right on the edge of school grounds, this bully would pick fights. And so all these kids would say, oh, I know karate, so go ahead. Come out there and fight me. I know karate. Well, you really found out who knew karate and who didn't when the fight started, right? Uh, when they got their face punched in and didn't even do anything, you knew they were probably just knew about as much karate as I did from Karate Kid. <laughs> we thought we could do the little the thing that he does in the movie, and it didn't quite work that way. Um, we, we need to have a proof to our Christianity. It's easy to say that we're Christian. Wear the Christian t-shirt, talk the lingo, have the cliches and the bumper sticker on our car, but where's the proof that we're really a follower of Jesus? If we claim the name Christian, or that we are a fully devoted Christ follower, then there will be evidence, God says. There will be works to prove it, and not just empty professions. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians 2.10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for what? For good works. You are made for good works. What God calls good, not what man calls good. Not what religion calls good, but what God says is good. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen? Every day, living our lives in the things that He calls good. Jesus will allow circumstances in our lives to test, to prove whether He really is exclusively the object of our faith, the foundation of our salvation. Also, after this life is over, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, says there's going to be a testing. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So we're all going to stand before God someday. We need to make sure that we're participating in the things that God wants us to be as his children. What type of judgment will it be? Brother Swaggart says this about the judgment seat of Christ. It will be the time when the works of all believers are judged. It will not be a judgment for believers' sins, for that was handled at Calvary. It will pertain only to the person's service for the Lord and the manner in which it was conducted and carried out. At this time, believers can lose their reward, as many will, but not their souls. And I think if you read the book of Revelation correctly, with the right timeline, this judgment seat of Christ happens very quickly. And the great white throne judgment happens very quickly after uh, the, uh, the, the uh, great tribulation, for, for sure, the seven year great tribulation, possibly before even the millennial reign starts, in the way I read it. And, and it says that after this judgment, I believe, the great white throne judgment, there's bickering and arguing about whether believers will be a witness at the great white throne judgment. Of course, the people who believe that we are say that it says we will judge nations, and so that's possible. It's possible that we'll see, think about it, Hitler, Capone, some of these people who mass murdered, all these people judged in front of God. It's possible. We won't have a say-so. God doesn't need us as eyewitnesses. Amen? He's, he's got good records. But it's possible that we'll see that. And it's for sure that we will be at the judgment seat of Christ if we're a believer. And there's going to be weeping, don't you think? There's going to be tears of regret. You're saved, you've made it to heaven, but all the missed opportunities that God brought your way by the Holy Spirit that you either shunned or missed or neglected or refused, and you're going to miss those rewards. I think there's going to be weeping. It won't be the weeping like a great white throne judgment when they're cast into outer darkness. And it says that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's a little different. But I believe there's going to be some tears shed at this judgment. And then after that, God will wipe away all tears from our eyes. And it won't be something that we dwell on for eternity. 
but we'll realize uh, the things that we missed in this life, at this judgment. And we need to understand that and make wise choices this side of the grave. Amen? This side of eternity. Psalms 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Can you say praise God? <laughs> if you look to Jesus and you look to the cross, this verse is meaningful. My sins are gone. Amen? I don't have to. The devil it doesn't mean the devil won't try and bring him up. But you can say, no, I gave my life to Jesus. I trusted in his sacrifice and I believe that my sins are as far as the east is from the west, which is immeasurable, right? God's not going to bring it up again. What will your faith look like when it's tested? When it's proven by the fire of God at the judgment seat of Christ? God wants us to be thinking about that today. No other foundation than Jesus. Number two, our faith has to be built up on a regular basis. Number three, our faith needs to have works. It needs to have evidence, proof. And it's going to be proven. It's going to be tested. Maybe that's what we're going through right now, folks. COVID-19. God's testing and refining the church. We need a true church to stand up before He comes back. Maybe we've been playing too many games. And God's refining us. He's getting us back to what really matters. Amen? We've already had so much talk about essential and non-essential. Maybe God, as a refiner, is refining and removing the things that are not essential in our lives. Showing us what's most important. Number four, the last point. If we're going to have faith refined in the fire. We're going to see the results of the testing and approving of our faith. We can see that in verse 14 and 15 and then again in 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 7, if our faith endures the test of God's fire, what awaits us? A reward, right? A reward awaits us. And that's awesome. That God is going to see the suffering that we've gone through. He's going to see the injustices. He's going to see the agony and the suffering that we've done for His sake. And it's not going to go unnoticed. Amen? He's going to reward a faith that endures. So many times in the book of Revelation, it says, to him that overcomes, and then he makes a promise of a blessing, a reward. But we need to stand on those promises. Unless the Holy Spirit is the one who works through us, the results will not be durable, because the materials will not be durable. He alone can produce works through us that will stand the examination of God. We ought to wake up every morning. We believe that quote. We ought to say, Holy Spirit, I need your help today. Help me not to say anything that's not glorifying Christ. Help me not to do anything that's not glorifying God. And then we need to say, God, by your Holy Spirit, help me to be involved in what I need to be involved in. Help me not to be passive, but to be active in my faith. Helping people find Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit's help if we're going to have the gold, the silver, and the precious stones that pass the fire test. If our faith is burned up in the test of God's fire, God's word says we will suffer loss of our reward, but we are still saved. Again, I believe there's going to be tears because there's not going to be much to show for our faith if it's all burned up in the fire. Thank God we're saved. It's going to be a whole lot better than if we do witness the great white throne judgment. We'll see a stark difference, right? And th those being cast into outer darkness, we're going to be thanking God that we get to spend eternity with Jesus. But we need to have something to show for it. Amen? Living our lives for the Lord each and every day. Listen to this quote. Is what we are doing of self or of the Holy Spirit? The sad fact is, most of what is presently done in the name of the Lord is in fact instituted and engineered by man and not the Holy Spirit. In fact, being led by the Holy Spirit is something which the far greater majority of the church knows absolutely nothing about. If the object of your faith is not Jesus and the cross, you don't have the help of the Holy Spirit. He only works within the confines, within the parameters of faith expressed, evidenced in God's redemption plan, which is Jesus, His one and only Son, coming and dying for us on the cross. If your faith is in something else, the Holy Spirit's not helping you. And you are subject to what the frailty of our human uh, existence. And yes, God's given us great intelligence. He's given us abilities that are amazing compared to the rest of creation. 
But we need the Holy Spirit to live the kind of life that God wants us to live. Do you want to have something lasting? Do you want to have something enduring and worthwhile to show for your faith when it's all said and done? I think all of us would say yes. Amen. We want it to be worth it. I believe it's going to be worth it when we see Jesus. It's going to be worth it after it's all done, the judgment seat of Christ, to be able to enjoy what Revelation 21 talks about. Streets of gold, walls of jasper, gates of pearl, the precious stones that, that are illuminated by the glory of the Lord, and to see Jesus, to see our loved ones who've gone before. We've lost a lot of friends, uh, our family has, in the last couple of weeks. And uh, it just makes heaven sound sweeter, doesn't it? I think maybe that's God's grace as you get older, as you realize there's probably more people in heaven than there are here <laughs> that you know. And it makes it not such a bad transition to be in, in the presence of the Lord. But those are things we have to look forward to. We need to make sure our faith is, is lasting and enduring. 1 Peter 1, verse 7. The genuine, genuineness of our faith is going to be tested, it says in that verse. Like the gold or silver in a refiner's cauldron, God will allow the heat of affliction and difficult circumstances to prove our faith, to refine it in the fire. Satan's goal is in the affliction, while you're in the flames of difficult times, to get you to abandon the object, the foundation of your faith, which is Jesus Christ and the cross. He wants your faith to no longer be in the fact that Jesus has made provision for everything that we need for life and godliness. He wants us to think we've got to make something happen on our own. We kick Jesus out of the driver's seat and we don't just put him in the back seat, we put him in the trunk and close it. And say, God, I'm going to drive for a while. We all know how that ends, right? The car gets wrecked and Jesus has to fix everything that we've broken. We don't need to keep doing that. We need to realize He's given us everything we need for life and godliness. God's desire as the refiner of your faith is to see His reflection in you a little bit more each day so that at Jesus' return, which I believe is much sooner than we think, at Jesus' return, you will be found unto praise and honor and glory. Jesus remained the object and the foundation of your faith and you never placed your faith in anything else. Jesus, I believed you. I want to become like you, your image, your likeness. So that when you stand next to Jesus, there's not much difference. Amen? Because of what the Holy Spirit has done in your life. That's God's desire. Don't try and jump out of the fire before God's done with the process. Amen? And I, how, I would love to move to Sweden or someplace where they're not having these restrictions. But God has a purpose. He's trying to do something in our nation right now. And we as a church, we as true believers ought to say, God, refine, purify what needs to be changed in my life, in my family, in my community. God, what needs to happen in Colorado Springs in this difficult time that we're in? Obviously, God's allowing it at least, if not causing it, for a purpose. And repentance needs to happen in our cities. Amen? Repentance definitely needs to happen in our nation. Our world is losing its mind more and more each day. And it's going to be a church that's had their faith refined in the fire that can bring about one more revival. Amen? One more harvest of souls before Jesus comes back. If we give up, if we throw in the towel, if we quit believing God or shift the object of our faith onto something wrong, what's the world going to have to look to? We need to stay firm in Jesus. Amen. Let Him refine our faith. Get in the Word. Turn off the news. Amen. Very little I watch anymore on TV. I used to watch the news uh, afternoon and evening and sometimes even in between. I can't, I can't even watch it anymore. Find out what God says. He's not going to give you lies, hidden agendas. He's going to give you the truth. And let's not be people of hysteria as the, tr as the church. That's what the media and the politicians want for society. They want a, a, a world that's full of hysteria, that's full of panic and fear and being controlled and not even knowing what to do. But we don't have to be that kind of people, amen? We can be a people of faith and have a faith that's proven, that's tested, and we can know that God's going to come through and we can be speaking to those lost ones and saying, you know what, life doesn't have to be like this. You can know Jesus. He can give you peace. He's the Prince of Peace. 
Amen? Let me tell you about Jesus. And I, I think we'll be surprised how God's going to turn this around for His glory. Amen? He's going to get glory out of this if we keep looking to Him. And let's believe the Lord for that today. Would you stand with me? I want us to close in prayer this morning. I know many are watching over Facebook Live. and We welcome you. Thank you for tuning in today. I want to ask you, is Jesus the foundation of your faith today? Is Jesus Christ and what He did at Calvary? You can't separate the two. He is who He is, and He did what He did. You can't separate Jesus from the cross. Is Jesus and the cross the foundation of your faith today? Is Jesus exclusively the one that you look to? He, as the master refiner, this morning He's trying to tell you He can burn up the impurities, the dross, the sin, the disobedience, the rebellion in your life. And He can make you forgiven. And He can make you holy. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, and that's not talking about to a priest, it's talking about to God. We say with God what He says about our sins. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe you've been lying to yourself and thinking you're lying to God, that everything's all right in your life. But you know deep down inside there's sin that needs to be forgiven. There's issues that need to be washed away by the blood of Jesus. If that's you this morning as we sing in just a moment, I want you to give your heart to Jesus in your own words. We're not going to pray the sinner's prayer like we normally do this morning. You can pray in your own words. Just say, God, I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I believe what you did on the cross was enough for me. God, forgive me, save me. Words just like that can allow you to be born again, and God can begin the process of refining your faith, making you more like Jesus. So if you need to be saved or you need to rededicate your heart, as we sing this song in just a moment, I want you to pray and invite Jesus in. Has your faith become stagnant, and you want the help of the Holy Spirit to build up your faith with the right durable materials that will stand the test of God's fire. If that's where you're at today, maybe you've been engaged in a lot of things that are just a waste of time, that really aren't going to matter when the trumpet sounds, really are going to be the wood, hay, and straw at the judgment seat of Christ, and you want your life to have meaning in the kingdom of God. I want you to reach out to the Lord as well as we sing in just a moment. Is the enemy trying to steal your faith in Jesus, and Jesus alone, by adversity or difficult circumstances? Is your heart's cry that Jesus help your faith to be proven genuine for the praise, the honor, and the glory of Jesus Christ when it's all said and done? I think that ought to be each one of our heart's desire. Lord, I want my life, when you show up, when you return for your church, God, I want my life to be for praise, honor, and glory. Amen? I want Jesus to say, that's my child. Amen? Come on home. And if you're not there, if there's some issues between you and the Lord, as we sing this song, Refiner's Fire, I'm going to ask Tanya to come help me this morning. I want you to make that decision. Respond to God's Word. You've heard the Word. Don't let it go in one ear and out the other. But let it change your heart. Amen? Let it change your heart. Let God do a work of His Holy Spirit in your life. I believe He wants to touch some people today. Whether you're online or whether you're here in the sanctuary, Let's take a moment as we sing this song and let's uh, respond to God's word this morning.
Would you join in prayer with me this morning? Let's respond corporately to what God's been saying this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. God, we just thank you for your word today. Lord, you said genuine faith is a faith that's going to be tested. It's going to be proven. God, I pray that we'll have the right foundation. God, that when you shake what needs to be shaken in our lives, we'll still have a firm foundation of Jesus Christ, what he did for us at the cross. Let our life be built upon that. Let the good works that we get involved with be for your glory and for your kingdom. God, not things that are wood, hay, and straw that are just going to burn up at that judgment seat of Christ. But God, let us have the gold and the silver and the precious stones, durable materials that your Holy Spirit has worked in our lives as we've yielded to him. Let that be the evidence and the proof of our Christian walk each and every day. Lord, help us to mature. Help us to be the believers that you want us to be. If there are those who are listening today, and Jesus, they're not saved, God, I pray that they'll submit their hearts to you. God, that they'll put their faith in who you are, Jesus, and what you've done for them, that finished work that you accomplished at Calvary. Lord, let them be born again. Let them be washed. Let them be cleansed. Lord, if there are those who need to rededicate their hearts to you, they've wandered away. They've become that prodigal son or daughter. They know better, God. They have your word in their hearts. Lord, I pray that you'll welcome them with open arms this morning as they repent and they turn to you. Lord, cleanse them of every sin. God, as we live in a time of difficult uh, circumstances, I pray that as a church we would be refined, that we would be consecrated, that we would be pure in our hearts. Lord, not living in hysteria, not living in fear or uh, controlled by lies of the enemy, but God, living in truth, God, having your peace that passes all understanding, being able to be a witness to those who may be caught up in the hysteria and the fear-mongering and the things that are going on right now in our world. God, help us to point people to Jesus. Lord, that, uh, show people that they can have a sound mind. They can have, God, your truth guiding them. Lord, let them see it evident in our lives each and every day. Lord, give us opportunities to sow a seed of the gospel in someone's life this week. Be in our city, God. Be in our nation. Bring us to repentance. Bring reformation, God, to our community and our nation. And Lord, pour out your spirit one more time. Let us be a part of that last day's move as your church. Lord, we'll give, we'll give you the glory. We'll give you the praise. Help us, Lord, just to have a blessed week, to keep uh, your presence near us throughout the week, we pray. We thank you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God bless you.